And Lou, if you're there, give me a thumbs up. Are we live? We are live. Hey, welcome everybody to the Rittenhouse monthly event. Uh, my name is Ted Williams and I'm the president of what is probably the oldest astronomical society in the country, and that's the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. I'd like to welcome you all here with us. And what's interesting is um, we have some patterns that we've had because we've been meeting quite a while. If you look at my backdrop, I've selected back at the Fells Planetarium. And the reason I did that tonight is because the last time we had one of the people who's been, uh, let's say a multiple presenter with us, who's in, in the background right now, Paul Halpern, the last time I got to talk with him and see him, this is where I'm sitting right here behind us. So I thought maybe it would make Paul feel a little bit at home. He's presented with us at the Franklin uh, three or four times. And I believe we've been promoting his books, you know, every time that we do that. So he's always a welcome guest. Um, so I was going to start off with just a little bit of a thought, everybody. Do you know the difference between a society and a community? Now think about that. The difference between a society and community. A society is built upon, uh, the main difference between a society and a community is the society is built upon interactions with varied people. Whereas the community is a collection of people with similar interests. I feel very proud that we're a society because if you look back over our website and you'll notice that I keep the speakers up there for quite some time, you'll notice that we definitely are a society. We have all different types of people coming together. Granted, most of us here do have a common interest, a sub-community that we could call astronomy. But the reason I'm proud to say that Rittenhouse is a society is if you look at what we bring to our membership, and that would be people from the musical field, people from the field of physics, uh, mathematics, science, and also history. And if you don't believe me, look down over our list of presenters for the last year on our website. It might be the last time you can do that too, because um, as a society, we have to move forward. And if we're going to maintain the communities within us, and we do have a few of them now, we're going to have to use the tools at hand. And that would be a modern website. Uh, we still have a website right now that is coded by hand, letter by letter. And that really only allows a couple of us to dig in and do that. Um, in the background, we've been working on a project. Uh, your board has uh, sanctioned it and uh, Lou has really helped us out a lot. Um, we've redesigned our website and we're hoping to launch that over the summer. So what's interesting everybody is if you're tuning in from around the world, um, you're more than welcome to be here with us. You're our YouTube audience. Um, we're not gonna stream this entire presentation tonight live. Normally we do stream our guest speakers live. Um, also know that to encourage a community within our society, that would really be our Astrocora evenings because those people are really gathering together and on two reasons. One is common interest and communities tend to be based geographically in one location. And most of our people from Astrocora are all in that Southeast or in the Pennsylvania area. And it's always interesting to see that it's branching out into Lancaster because of our involvement there. So I'm proud to say um, this is the oldest Astrocora astronomical society, we're not just a community, and uh, proud to be a part of that. So tonight we have a, something a bit of a, a, a pattern that we've been in. Usually at June, everyone's re ready to go. When I first joined the society, we were doing field trips. Do you remember that, <laughs> Denise? We would try to do a field trip in June. And I remember traveling over to the Edelman Planetarium one time. I remember traveling over to uh, Swarthmore one time. And I think we even went up to uh, Princeton at one time. They have a clock, one of the Rittenhouse clocks that's in Peyton Hall up there, one of the orreries. So we did some little trips like that. And then that got turned into from trips into allowing member, we would have a lot of interaction with each other. So we didn't want to give up the use of the planetarium at that time. And we decided that we'd uh, uh, give the usage over to our members. So the June night typically became a members night when members were able to present. Um, Adam just tuned in. Adam's presented on a June night. And when we've done this in the past as members, Adam's from uh, my uh, planetarium out in the Thackman School District. So tonight we have a couple people who I thought I'd entice people to get here with. We're going to do um, the two big headers up front. Uh, I don't want to say big headers, I'll say return speakers for us because the first one is going to be Paul Halpern. Paul, can you turn your Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul Halpern? Paul, do you have your camera on? There we go. It's got so many people here. Um, Lou, if I highlight, you said that if I highlight, highlight the speaker view at my end, and does that make it better for YouTube? 
Yes, it does. Okay. Okay. So I just did that. Um, Paul has multiple books that he's published in the past with us. He's a local physics professor and he's kind of favorite return uh, guest speaker for us because I remember even Mike Mountjoy says, oh yes, I have one of his autograph books and I have a couple of his books. And that's odd, Paul, because we can't do that this year. We're not going to have autograph books as much, but who knows, maybe September and October, we might be able to meet some way. So Paul's going to do a little bit of a teaser for us to open up. He wants to talk a little bit about his new book and uh, maybe even like a little bit of the pre-stuff that I was talking with. You want to share how you went about and did the, yeah, okay. You can talk yeah. that too. And what we're going to do is we're, Paul's going to have the book release in August and then we're going to have him back as our main event speaker so we can dig into the topic a little more. And that's going to be our September meeting. So Paul, you won't have to bear with questions and answers tonight because I'm going to do that to you in September when we open it up and maybe we'll have some people pick up the book and read it and really want to dig in with you. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Halpern, Dr. Halpern, uh, favorite return speaker to Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. Okay. So I wanted to thank, uh, thank the group and thank uh, Ted in particular for inviting me. Um, hope everyone can hear me well. So, um, oops. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great, great. I'm sorry. Okay. Yep, just fine. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, about my new book, which is coming out in October, Flashes of Creation, George Gamow, Fred Hoyle and the Great Big Bang debate. So, um, if you're interested in in taking a look at the project, there's a website associated with it, flashesofcreation.com. And I wanted to say a little bit about what the book is about, just to sort of a you know a teaser for the book. So here I am. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the Horn antenna in Homedale Bell Labs. And I would um, highly recommend um, that for a visit. It's, it's absolutely free. And that's where the hiss, which turned out to be evidence for the Big Bang was discovered. It's in Northern New Jersey. It's very close to the New Jersey Turnpike. So if you haven't seen the Horn Antenna, please do so. Um, it's, I would highly recommend a visit there. And this was used, some of you may know, for the ECHO satellite project. And this was a Bell telephone project for satellite communications. And this was used to pick up signals from a satellite. And then two uh, astronomers, radio astronomers, uh, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, decided to adapt it to engage in a study of galactic halos. Penzias was convinced that there's a halo around the galaxy that sends off radio signals. And they wanted to pick up these radio signals and prove the existence of a halo. And other physicists and astronomers were dubious about this. They thought it was kind of a crazy project. But Penzias had the opportunity to use the antenna and to look for these signals. And um, if you visit the, the Horn telescope today, you can actually go up into the cabin and strangely enough, uh, the, the radio receiver is, is missing there, but it's actually in a museum in Germany now. It was donated by Penzias. So this used to be up in the, in the cabin and this picked up signals that were um, collected by the horn antenna. And they were looking for this evidence of the Milky Way halo, but um, they kept seeing noise using their um, strip detector. And the noise was rather puzzling because no matter how they uh, positioned the, the receiver and no matter what they did to try to, to eliminate external effects, they kept seeing this, this noise in all, in all directions, um, this, this persistent hiss. And as some of you may know, they even um, cleaned up the receiver because they thought there might be white dielectric material, um, which 
which is was their way of saying pigeon droppings on the receiver. And they thought that that might be um, the source of the noise. But once they cleaned everything up and they actually captured pigeons in this cage, which is now in the Smithsonian Museum, um, they still saw the noise in all directions. Um, so that was even more puzzling. But as it turned out, it proved to be signals from the Big Bang from, uh, that were actually transmitted when atoms uh, were first formed some thousands of years or tens of thousands of years after the Big Bang. And a, a massive amount of radiation was released in the early universe. That radiation started off very, very hot and cooled down over the years. And this discovery, which was, um, which was, was found in 1964 to 1965, was the first evidence for the Big Bang. Now, Penzias and Wilson had no idea that this, these signals were even being looked for and they were astonished that they made a cosmological discovery. Um, Wilson had no interest in cosmology. And in fact, he did not believe in the Big Bang theory. He believed in the rival theory, which is called the steady state theory. The difference between the Big Bang and the steady state theory is that the Big Bang posits that the universe began in a very compact, condensed, hot state. And the steady state theory imagines that the universe persisted forever. Both of them are expanding universe models, but in the steady state model, galaxies move apart and new material is slowly formed in between the galaxies. That material coagulates over time and eventually forms new stars and new galaxies. So the universe pretty much recycles itself over time. And as it expands, new galaxies fill up the gaps. And that's the steady state theory. The Big Bang theory was originally uh, proposed by uh, George Lemaitre, a Belgian priest, but it was greatly uh, expanded by um, George Gamov, a Russian physicist who posited that the Big Bang uh, produced all the matter in the universe. All the elements were produced in the hot Big Bang. And Hoyle had a different theory of how the elements were produced. Fred Hoyle was the founder of the steady state universe. He imagined that the elements are all produced in stars. And uh, I, I will show in my book how both of them were correct to, to a certain extent. Some of the elements were produced in the Big Bang, other elements were produced in stars. But anyway, um, surprisingly, Penzias and Wilson resolved a battle that they didn't even know existed. And uh, Wilson told me that this headline was, was the first time he realized that he had made a major discovery. And the reason he realized it was a major discovery is because his father picked up the New York Times that morning and saw it on, on the, uh, the front page of the New York Times and, and was like, wow, you made a big discovery to Bob Wilson. So it was, it was pretty amazing. Now, as it turned out, the person who uh, confirmed the discovery, Bob Dickey, an astronomer from Princeton, had some of his students and assistants looking for signals, not from the Big Bang itself, but from, he thought that the universe um, oscillates and he was looking for evidence of radiation from a previous incarnation of the universe. So uh, he set out some of his students and assistants to build a radio receiver, but before they could build the receiver to detect this radiation, he found out from Arno Penzias about the discovery. And Arno Penzias was baffled and Arno Penzias was told that Bob Dickey was the person to talk to. And um, so Dickey um, was the one who uh, set out his uh, assistant, Jim Peebles, who's pictured here 
in later years to, um, to try to unravel the signal. So I met Jim Peebles uh, at a conference in honor of Bob Dickey a few years ago. And I sat at this table with Jim Peebles, Jim Peebles' wife, Allison Peebles, and this is Bob Wilson, one of the co-discoverers of the radiation. And I asked them, I said, I know you've told this story many times before, but what was it like to find out, I asked Jim Peebles, what was it like to find out about this radiation discovery? And Jim Peebles said he was in Bob Wilson's off, uh, Bob Dickey's office and the phone rang and he could tell from the other end of the conversation that something was going on. And finally, after Bob Dickey hung up, he said, boys, we've been scooped. Someone beat us to the discovery. And Jim Peebles set out to show that this was radiation that was cosmological of our origin. And people showed that it was evidence of the Big Bang. Um, even though Dickey was not a, really a believer in the Big Bang, he was a believer in the oscillating universe. Wow. So this resolved the question of the Big Bang versus steady state. Now, what my book is about um, briefly is the, the, the battle between these two scientists, George Gamow and Fred Hoyle. George Gamow was the great spokesman for the Big Bang starting in 1948. Fred Hoyle was a great spokesman for steady state. And the two of them battled in the press in newspaper articles, many people were following the, these battles, these discoveries. Um, so I interviewed people who were, uh, I interviewed one person who was a kid at that time and wrote to Bob Dickey uh, asking about this discovery because he was fascinated by um, this battle. And uh, this kid who was interested in this battle, uh, I, tr I tracked him down. He's a professor of computer science now. And he was delighted that I found his letter that he wrote, he wrote when he was a kid to Bob Dickey asking about Big Bang versus steady state. But he was far from the only one enticed by this battle. Um, this was a major headlines and books, articles, radio shows. And uh, strangely enough, Fred Hoyle was the one who coined the term Big Bang. He meant it, meant, meant it derisive. He meant as, as, a, as a, a negative term uh, because he thought it was a silly idea that all the matter in the universe would stem from a single point in time. And so he tried in, during his lifetime to disprove it. Uh, Gamov was trying to uh, prove the Big Bang. But then after the discovery by Penzias and Wilson, the two of them had other issues to deal with. Gamov had been forgotten for some of his discoveries. So he had to kind of reestablish his reputation. I'll talk a little bit about why in my book. And then Hoyle had to decide what to do. At first he started embracing the Big Bang, but then he started to develop newer theories. So, and he, he lived for quite a while afterwards and kept coming up with um, newer ideas. These two, as I show in my book, were incredibly quirky scientists. And uh, this is Gamov and his assistants, um, Alpha and Herman. And, uh, and then this is uh, Hoyle and two of the other people who developed the steady state model, uh, Tommy Gold and Herman Bondi. And I'll talk a little bit about how these ideas came about, some of the strange things about it. Um, steady State, the idea came about in a horror movie. I'll talk a little bit about that in my book. So there's all sorts of fun facts and stories in my book. I gathered interviews from most of the people involved who are still alive, including the children of the scientists, some of their co-workers. I interviewed Jim Peebles, who later, a few weeks later, won the Nobel Prize. I interviewed two other Nobel Prize winners, uh, Penzias and Wilson. I interviewed, um, you know, some of their uh, other assistants. And uh, so the book is chock full of archival material, interviews, exclusive content, funny stories, 
tragic stories. So it's it's it has my signature uh, touch of being about the scientists and their lives as well as about the science. So I hope you uh, pick up a copy of uh, Flashes of Creation. And uh, oh, here's, here's a little bit more that's in it, how Gamov uh, drew cartoons. He developed the Mr. Tompkins series. Uh, Hoyle wrote operas. He wrote an opera about space, Copernicus, along with Leo Smith. He wrote science fiction novels. So the two of them were incredibly diverse characters. So this book is coming in August. I've used up my, my 15 minutes. Oh, uh, and Paul, what a perfect season finale, like the cliffhanger to come on back, everybody. No, that was great. I, I don't want to diminish anyone behind you, but And I, I wrote a lot of the book during lockdown. I, I researched it right before lockdown, and I wrote most of it during lockdown, during the quarantine. So right. that's my quarantine story. So, so it's, your it's your therapy that got you through quarantine, right? Yeah, exactly. So I'll be excited about coming back. Um, in, yeah, in he's going to be OK. So everybody, he's going to be at our September uh, event. Uh, we do not have an event in uh, July and August. We usually you know, rest for the summer. So he'll be kicking off our academic year. And like I said, if you have questions, we'll, we'll devote more time to him at that point. But oh, Paul, what a perfect like season finale. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Great uh, to Dave, you, everybody. Dave, uh, I've asked you to unmute yourself in the background there. Um, let me give me a second. Do you want me to put my slot your slides up or do you want to talk a second and then just ask for first slide? Uh, I just like to say that what a wonderful book. <laughs> I tell you what. Uh, and and I'd also like to say that I've read the Black Cloud. I've read Frontiers of Astronomy. I've met half of the guys you talked about and studied the rest. And so have you. Uh, I know. Uh, delightful, just delightful. Okay, so let me uh, start. Don't uh, put the first slide up if you would. Okay, please. give me a sec. Okay. Okay, I'm David Brown. Um, I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I was uh, had a wonderful time designing uh, with a couple of other fellows. The uh, rover, uh, the Perseverance rover entry, descent, and landing cameras. And this little talk is meant to be a brief because 15 minutes isn't enough. However, it's what we can do. So on the first slide, I present a series of references. Uh, I don't know if, you know if these slides will be available to the membership later, but uh, those references, if you go to them, they'll provide movies and, and a lot of other data. The, the paper by Maki is uh, a delightful paper, very, very inclusive. And there's a lot of information in there on the cameras on Perseverance, if you're interested. The YouTube movie, of course, shows the uh, landing of, um, of the uh, rover taken through these EDL cameras in, uh, in, in detail. Uh, and that's a fun thing to see. I won't talk about it here because there's just not enough time. Okay, so um, the um, other thing to say is that while I work at NASA uh, and I've worked on these cameras directly from JPL, um, this uh, talk has not been approved or adopted by NASA. Uh, those words are on this slide as well. This is a, um, an informal talk. Okay, having said that, um, about seven or eight years ago, I received a phone call from a fellow named Dave Gruel, a delightful uh, integration and test manager of Perseverance. Um, what a fellow he was, or is actually, he's a younger fellow. Uh, delight to work for and just a very nice person as well. He asked me if I'd be interested in working on these EDL cameras. Uh, turns out that I had worked on all the cameras for the Mars Exploration Rover camera, the Mars Exploration Rover, and uh, so this sort of fit right in that, in that uh, roundhouse. So I said, sure, I'd, I'd really delight, you know, I'd be delighted to do that. The first thing that um, he was questioning was this, that the EDL folks were interested in parachute dynamics 
and uh, whether their predictions and estimates and measurements and so on uh, worked as well as they thought they would. They wanted to actually see the parachute deployed uh, on the, the Perseverance rover. So we, the idea was to build a camera to show that. So in order to do that, um, naturally you have to find out about the parachute. You've got to find out about its geometry, uh, how fast it moves, uh, how far away it is when it's fully deployed, um, and so on. And it turns out that uh, I learned a lot. And I learned, amazingly enough, that that parachute is deployed with a, a mortar. Imagine uh, <laughs> explosive charge uh, on a $2 billion <laughs> spacecraft. Um, in any case, uh, they must do it very well because they have these things on aircraft as well. We, as we know, the air fighter aircraft have these things to eject people with. But uh, the, the other thing that I learned that was amazing was the fact that this thing deploys, having been shot out of this mortar, in two seconds, actually less than two seconds. So it moves fast because it, when it is uh, in fully deployed, it's about 50 meters away. So this puppy really moves quickly. Um, in the process of designing this camera, you have to consider things like the sh brightness of the parachute as illuminated by the sun, the camera frame rate, that's basically the exposure time, camera resolution, of course, and the sensitivity, the, the photometric sensitivity of the camera. And we have to concern ourselves with the fact that we want good resolution uh, of these images from the point time when the parachute just leaves the parachute housing until it's fully deployed at, at 50 meters. So there's this space over which you've got to have good res resolution. Okay, that was the first thing uh, I learned about the parachute. And um, we also uh, were given the task that, that uh, we, people wanted to use, I think correctly wanted to use commercial off the shelf parts to cobble this thing together with. They wanted to cut the cost, keep the cost low, and cut the development time because there wasn't a lot of time to develop this be before it had to be uh, mounted on the rover itself. So, uh, or on the spacecraft itself. And the other uh, design philosophy was do no harm to perseverance. This is a, an add-on, a last minute add-on uh, and, uh, and an inexpensive one at that. And the last thing you wanna have happen is something worth maybe a few hundred thousand dollars uh, harm a $2 billion or one to $2 billion spacecraft. So we had to do no harm. So these things were all pretty much autonomous. Um, we looked at various uh, camera body manufacturers uh, as well as lens manufacturers and came up with some based on our previous experience. Um, in the paper by Maki, he, he mentions the names of these outfits. One was uh, the, the camera body was made by Point Grey now FLIR, and uh, it's a CMOS color camera. And the uh, optics were uh, built by uh, 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 Universe Kogaku America. Uh, we used one of their lens prescriptions and modified it substantially. Uh, let's see now, let us... Um, so finally, we came up with a design. It looked like it was gonna be practical. And, um, people started thinking about it saying, huh, if we can build this uh, as inexpensively as we think, uh, as you say, then wow, we should have cameras looking down on the rover as it descends from the descent stage uh, onto the surface of Mars. And then also we should have cameras on the surface of the rover looking up uh, at the descent stage. And also <laughs> on the bottom of the rover, looking at the surface of Mars as well. So it turned out that um, it became it burgeoned, this, this process burgeoned, and we, we ended up with four different kinds of cameras. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. And there, there you are, I've got a, uh, if you look at the upper right-hand side, this is my hand-drawn, hand-sketched uh, slide. I hope it's okay for by you. Uh, it shows the spacecraft schematic and um, the location of the various cameras on that spacecraft schematic. Uh, you can see at the upper part, 
we started out looking for the parachutes, if you recall, uh, the upper part uh, of the thing, the vertex up there shows a, a parachute uplook camera, they call it. And uh, then uh, the next uh, section down, you see the descent stage, also known as a sky crane, and you see a camera on that looking down toward the rover, which is the next level down. That's, the rover is in yellow, the descent stage is in uh, uh, blue, and, uh, and then finally you have the uh, heat shield in orange. And the bottom of the rover uh, shows, a, there's a camera on the bottom of the rover, as well as on the top of the rover. And obviously the one on the top of the rover is looking at the descent stage as it is lowered to the, to the Martian surface. And the one uh, on the bottom of the rover will watch the heat shield deploy as well as the surface of Mars as it comes into focus, as it gets closer. Now the next part of this uh, slide, it's a busy part. Uh, if you look at the upper left, you'll see the, the, the spacecraft coming in before the parachute shoot is deployed. Uh, the parachute's deployed at about seven miles up. It's moving uh, about, the, the spacecraft's moving at about 600 miles an hour. And that chute just pops right out of there in about two seconds. And uh, I have shown there in black dots, I don't know how well this shows up on your screen in terms of scale, um, in black dots, the, the cameras that are active at the time. Uh, you have the the camera that is uh, looking up at the parachute and you have a camera on the bottom of the rover looking down at the heat shield. Um, and then a little bit later, uh, you have uh, the back shell separation uh, uh, and the uh, uh, heat shield uh, deployment, I should say the heat shield deployment comes next. And you can see uh, that we'll show you some images in detail those images. Uh, and then finally, the back shell separates at about 6,900 feet. Uh, and the rover and the descent stage uh, slowly lower to the, you know, are lower to the ground. Uh, rover separates from the, the uh, descent stage at about 70 feet altitude. And it's moving laterally a few miles an hour, as you can see. So I've shown some thumbnail images of this whole process. The, the uh, shoot deploy uh, near the shoot deploy, the, the uh, heat shield set, uh, as you can see, and then finally the, uh, where the sky crane is lowering the, the rover, you can see the image of the sky crane itself uh, upper, and then finally the, the image of the rover as it's lowered un underneath. And finally, uh, you can see images of the ground as the thing comes up to the ground. Now, uh, if you go to slide three, please, the third slide, I'm trying to move along here as best I can. Doing good. I'm, I'm uh, playing along, pointing out all the things you're saying. And I appreciate that. Go ahead. Um, this is a, a list of parameters and you know, it's an, what they call an eye chart in my business. Uh, just a whole slew of, of different parameters there. It's just to show that, yeah, there are four different cameras and they have different fields of view and, and F numbers and focal lengths and all of that. Um, and it shows some of the parameters for that. So I just wanted to talk about the design considerations. In other words, these cameras just don't show up by magic, right? You just don't go to somebody and say, give me this, give me that and then put it together and somehow it magically works. You actually have to design these things. And so, for example, uh, we'll talk about some simple ideas. For example, field of view. You could imagine how you would design a field of view of a camera, right? Um, you, you could say, okay, let's just take the, let's take the parachute for an example. Uh, field of view of the parachute, the parachute we know is 50 meters away from the camera. And we know the parachute's 15 meters in diameter. And we know, for example, that we want to leave a little bit on the left and the right all around it because the parachute might move left, right, and center. Who knows? So 
that helps to define the field of view, the, the focal length and the size of the detector. The pixel size helps to uh, determine some of the resolution of the, of the uh, of that parachute. And the other, other kinds of parameters that we have to concern ourselves with are the F number and frame rate. This is just like your, your, your camera at home. Uh, you know, if uh, you worry about target brightness, so if the target is really bright, you lower the F number or you increase the F number, I should say. The cone angle of the light entering the, the pixel that's gonna intercept that light um, is, is smaller, the cone angle is smaller for a bright target and it's bigger for a, a dimmer target. Similarly, the frame rate uh, is used to, to adjust target brightness too. If you slow the frame rate down, you can jack up the signal in the pixel as you might imagine. But we also have to worry about, concern ourselves with a frame rate in terms of the separation velocity of the, of the parachute, right? So the frame rate enters in a couple of different ways and we have to balance these things. Then comes this idea of best focus where, for example, the parachute is going to be 50 meters away. We know that. So we want that to be best focus at 50 meters. But we also want it to be in focus between the time it's shot out of this mortar till the time it gets the best focus. And the way we adjust that is we adjust that by playing with the focal length, playing with the aperture, playing with the pixel size, and coming up with what we call an, an acceptable blur spot size that, that is kind of a, um, it, it, it's, a it's a concept of, uh, it's good enough if it's within this blur spot size. But of course, um, if, if you're at best focus, you want that to be very crisp, not, not a very blurry spot at all. Then there are other things that we have to concern ourselves in terms of the design. We have to concern ourselves in terms of the temperature of the, the cameras as they find their way uh, from launch uh, all the way through cruise and then landing on Mars. What, what's the temperature? It turns out that, that the temperature variation of the cameras was pretty darn benign by space camera uh, uh, <laughs> uh, experience, uh, minus 20 degrees C to plus 50 degrees C. And that's like minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So you could survive this trip. You personally could be on board the spacecraft and survive it. Now we make margin around that. In other words, when we do, when we build stuff, we don't just take these numbers, we add margin to it. But basically that's what was expected. In terms of vibration, this thing has to launch uh, from, a, a, you know, in a rocket ship, right? And the thing's going to vibrate like crazy on its way up. So we have to make sure that the optics are snug down, that all the mechanics, everything is snug. Things are bonded properly. All are mounted solid, all these different parts. Finally, you've got things like radiation. You have to concern yourself with the radiation on the trip. Uh, the rear of the camera itself, the radiation, by the way, will destroy a camera. It will take lenses and turn them brown if there's too much of it. It will take detectors and produce tremendous amounts of noise. So you have to protect from this. And uh, we do this by positioning the camera in the spacecraft properly. So you have a large body of the spacecraft behind it, protecting the back end of it. At the front end, when you're looking through the lens, we put a chunk of, uh, not a chunk, a flat of uh, uh, rad tolerant glass in front of it. And we AR code it, uh, that, that then protects the glass and the detector from the front end of this. And then there are other things we have to concern ourselves with. We have to concern ourselves with things like the pressure release, right? When, the, when you launch, you're going from atmospheric pressure to the space, and you've got these little lenses in there. And if you're not careful, they can vary in thick, vary in separation, I should say. Uh, if there is at one point, uh, one atmosphere pressure in there, and then at another point, a vacuum. So you have to find a way to evacuate those little spaces by drilling tiny little holes in, in, in uh, the, the housings for the camera optics. And you have to concern yourselves with things like cleanliness. Uh, the gas, the uh, various parts in there have to be clean. Uh, the materials, uh, plastics, uh, uh, things like uh, glues have to be very clean. As an example, let's imagine you're sitting in a, in, a, in a new car on a hot day 
outside in, in, in Philly. And you notice that that new car has this smell, right? When you get in the car uh, uh, after having left it outside for a while. And it turns out that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the plastics in the car itself uh, evaporate. They boil off due to the heat and, and they condense on the, the windscreen of your car and the windshield of your car, leaving a, a thin film. You've noticed that. We've all noticed that. Well, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, except ex in the extreme of space, uh, it, it's different. You really have to care about that. And then we do things like building in margin, and as I mentioned earlier. So we, we have an expected temperature range that we're going to operate over, but then we extend that on a little bit on the cold and the hot side to make sure that we're confident that whatever happens, we can tolerate. And the same thing goes with vibration, radiation, and all these other things. In the end, it turns out that Basically, uh, engineering experience and intuition played a big role in the design of these cameras because we wanted to keep things inexpensive. We wanted to make this development process quick. And, and, uh, and, uh, and it turns out that you really do, after <laughs> working on cameras for a long time, you develop this, this toolkit that helps you to uh, design these things. Now, if we go to the next pick, the next slide, please. Um, that shows some of the images. Uh, these are taken uh, with these cameras. They're raw images, unprocessed. Uh, they're they're uh, uh, they're uh, what should I say? Stills because there wasn't time to show the whole movie and go through the whole shebang. So you can see pictures of the parachute looking up, fully deployed there. Um, quite crisp and clear. Similarly, uh, in the rover down look, uh, uh, I mean the uh, descent down look, uh, sorry, there are so many blasted cameras. <laughs> the rover down look, we see the uh, heat shield uh, deploy. Uh, you can see, uh, I have two or three images here. First in the very back shows the interior of the heat shield and it shows you can make out features there, even though that is right up very close to the camera. And then at this point where the thing is in best focus, you can see quite the next one, quite a detailed image. And then as it moves away, it's the, the, the image is still pretty darn well focused, even though it's far away at this point. Now that's the rover downlook camera. And finally, you see the, the soil as the uh, rover uh, comes down onto the Martian surface. Um, the next one is the descent down look camera. The, it shows in the back, it shows a picture of the rover shortly after it started uh, its journey to the, the Martian surface. And um, it shows a lot of detail there. And then finally, the, the image uh, as it was uh, shown quite a ways away from the descent uh, stage, you can see the tether there spiral, spiraling around. I mean, the electronic portion of the tether. I'm sorry. And then you see the three mechanical parts hanging there as well, taut. Those are mechanical tethers. And then finally, my favorite image is looking up at this uh, 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 sky crane or descent stage, if you want to call it that. I think that's just a cool picture. And, uh, and that's about it, folks. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. um, I just said amazing, and you must have some fascinating times at work. <laughs> it's an amazing it's a lot of fun. Uh, Thank you, thank you so much. Let me stop the share here for a second so I can regain. Oh, right, thank you, Dave. Okay, um, if Dave hangs on to the end, maybe some people have some questions, but I want to move along right now. I want to introduce. Pretty awesome. Mistress of the Universe. I'm going to turn it over to Denise. She does a little bit of our planet report for us, and we're keeping the YouTube live. Um, those of you who have tuned in to our live stream, uh, we are the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, probably the oldest astronomical society in the country. And today we're presenting our vice president, uh, Mistress of the Universe, Denise Vaca. Hi, Denise. Hi, everybody. Wow. Um Guys, those two presentations were amazing. Paul and Dave, thank you very much. You don't realize how much thought goes into 
everything. And it's just so exciting that we have members that are doing this great, great stuff for us. So thank you so much for presenting. You might be wondering why I'm in the dark. I have two parts of my presentation tonight, my planet report. But before we did that, I wanted to just show everybody an activity I got from the Night Sky Network. We get all these activities all the time. And since uh, light pollution is something that I'm kind of adamant about, and um, I know a lot of our members are too, there is a great demonstration that you can do with tools that you have at home. If you just wanted to show uh, people at an event or your neighbor, if they have a light that's blinding you, uh, you can do a little demonstration. So I'm going to turn my camera. Hopefully you'll be able to see in a moment. And let me show you my tools. I have a little cover here. It looks like the top of a, you know, a paint can or something. We have uh, Copernicus, which is a little bear. And they sent me all this stuff. We have a piece of green felt and we have a mini mag light flashlight. And I'm going to put that on and I'm going to put it in candle mode to represent a street light. So let's put it right here and everybody can see my street light. We're going to put Copernicus. He's hanging out underneath the street light. You can barely see him. Okay. What, what is the street light? This is how a lot of street lights are too. Some of them might have a little bit of a shield, but what's lighting up? What do you think? What, what can you guys see? If I'm, you see my hand and my arm, you can't really see what's at the bottom. Whoops. Falling over. Let me put up again. But look what happens if we do with if we have proper lighting and proper shielding on those lights. Look at the difference when we put a shield on that. Now what's lighting up? The wow. felt. And you can see Copernicus down there at the bottom. Maybe not so great because it's kind of far away. But if I move it a little closer. Oh, it's working perfect, Denise. Oh, okay. You can see because oh, I'm yeah. blinded because I looked right at the mag light. So yep, I'm blinded great. right now. But yeah. look at the difference. I mean, this way, this way blocks out the sky okay can't see nothing it doesn't even help there could be somebody murdering copernicus down here <laughs> um and you wouldn't even know it but you put the shield on and he's lit up great the whole, in fact more of the area below is lit up so what we need to teach people is not lights are good you know we can have lights we just have to have properly shielded lights so that is I think an easy, simple thing we could show our families. I've shown my friends. I'm, I'm so excited about this that I think it's great. And it really proves the point and gets it home uh, how bad light pollution is uh, in our skies. We don't need that. It doesn't even work. So let's do it right and educate people about it. So you don't even need a little bear, but you can get one. You can use anything you have around the house if you have a Denise, the effect is great on the computer screen. You should film it or use this as a clip and yeah. teach it. Yeah, it's great. Works great. Thank you for your terrific. feedback. Yeah. I'm going to turn some light on just so everybody can see me. Now. Although uh, I, I forget who I was saying it to. It was Ted. Um, I think part of the reason we like astronomy and we like working in planetariums is because we enjoy working in the dark. What's up? <laughs> and I am a little bit blinded right now because I did look right at the mag light. Once again, they sent me all this stuff in the toolkit. I didn't have to buy anything. They even sent the batteries for the flashlight. So if you're not a member of the Night Sky Network, become a member. All right. And uh, we get it because I log every meeting and after the meeting, I log it as well. So let's talk about what's going on in the sky. Now, I know we're not going to be here for the rest of the summer, but a lot of the things that I'm talking about planet wise, we'll still be able to see. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm just going to share my whole screen. OK, so a couple of things we have. I'm going to move you guys so I don't see you. And I'm going to bring up tonight I'm using Stellarium rather than Sky Safari. So I have it set up for now and hopefully everybody can see it. Um, and I have it set up with some trees. I, I do like the ocean view, but I have it in the West. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move time just a little bit and we can see what planets are up there in the evening. So as soon as it starts getting dark, we should be able to see um, Venus, which I don't know if Dave's going to talk about, but we're planning on going there again, which is kind of exciting. And Mars. Whoa, stop, Denise. I had, okay, let's do it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like you get start getting used to one software and then you start using another one. 
Okay, so Venus is up there. Obviously, it's behind that tree there. Um, but and Mars is up there too. Now, uh, around the 23rd, I believe, Mars is going to be near the Beehive Cluster. So, all you astrophotographers out there, that might be a good opportunity uh, for you guys to, um, you know, get out and look at that. Uh, we can't see Uranus right now. It's below the horizon. Uh, but a little later on in the evening, I'm going to move our view. Let's go a little bit more towards the east because that's where the planets are going to be. Uh, let's stop right about here. And once again, Stellarium, definitely not as pretty as Sky Safari, but it's going to do what I need it to do for today. So let's move it a little bit faster. And as we can see, the, as the later you stay up, we're going to start seeing the stars of the Summer Triangle. Um, I just learned that there, I don't, has anyone ever heard, and you can unmute and just tell me because I can't see, I turn your pictures off. Has anyone ever heard of the Tweedledum and Tweedledee um, clusters? No, I haven't. I'm They're, interested. I just learned about them in the Sky Safari. Um, they have a calendar in there. And you'll have to excuse me for a second because I'm just checking my phone because I don't remember exactly. You know what? I'll come back later and let you know where they are because I don't want to take up the time looking up the information. But yeah, there's a Tweedledum and Tweedledee and it's around the Summer Triangle. So we're going to have to find those. Uh, I think they have you know, different names that might be more familiar, but I always loved Alice in Wonderland. So I thought that would be something fun to look at. Now, as we go a little bit into uh, midnight, a little after midnight, Saturn by quarter of one is up. So Saturn and Jupiter, you no longer have to wait till early in the morning to see them. You can get out there if you're at the bar or whatever. Now that we're allowed to go out places uh, by two o'clock, you can pretty much see uh, those two planets in the you know, evening skies over there in the southeast. Now, tomorrow morning, that's the biggie. Now, I don't know how the weather is going to be here from Philadelphia, but that is when we're going to have an annual solar eclipse, the ring of fire. The moon is a little bit further away from us, so it's not going to block the whole disk. Uh, so it's going to have that beautiful ring around it. And hopefully we'll be able to see it in this software. It's We're not going to see the whole eclipse. It's already going to be eclipsed as it uh, rises for us. So sunrise is about 530. So if you want to try, if you're up that early, you might as well uh, get a good uh, southeastern or excuse me, northeastern facing sky. That's pretty, you know, a nice horizon. Don't have a lot of trees because it's only going to be till about 630 that we're going to be able to see this. Now, I, I might take my chances and use my old solar shades from 2017. But if you don't, uh, you should try and find a definite, uh, you have to have eye protection to see this. You don't want to go out looking at the eclipse without it. So uh, by 559, the sun is still partially covered by the moon. If we go back a little bit further, hopefully we can. When the sun rises, let's put it right at sunrise. And I didn't figure out how to do this in Sky Safari. That is why I'm doing it. So when it rises, it's actually going to look like a crescent moon. So, well, it's not really going to look like a crescent moon, but through your glasses, it will look like a crescent moon. The sun's still going to be bright. And I'm kind of curious, maybe somebody can let me know if you know this answer. Will the average layperson know that there's an eclipse going on? Like how much dimmer will the sun be? Because the sun's pretty bright, even a partial bit of the sun in our sky is, is still bright enough that it lights up the whole earth. So, or at least what we can see. So I'm curious if the average person is even gonna know that there is an eclipse going on. And so this is gonna happen at from about 5.30 on uh, till about 6.30. So you have about an hour uh, to find a place. So go out, you know, I would say go out by five o'clock and have uh, your, your coffee and, a donut or whatever you like, nice Danish, and uh, see if you can see the eclipse. All right, I, I'm going to keep sharing, but I'm going to stop slaring. Or maybe a croissant. Or, or a croissant, that's right. Um, yeah, just don't eat too many. Okay, so I'm going to quit Stellarium. Uh, so we still have our regular planets. Uh, Mars is kind of getting a little lower. Venus is getting beautiful. And, you know, those planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, it's nice to have them up a lot earlier than they were. Um, Neptune is up there too, uh, but obviously you need a uh, telescope or but you could pair binoculars to see it. So let's see, I have two other pictures because I just wanted, or three, I wanted to show you something. Um, 
that we talked about before, but on, let me see the exact date. It's going to be on, I'm sorry, it's still dark in here. Um, this 18th, so Friday night, we are going to be able to see Rupus Recta, or as I like to call it, Rupert's Rectum. <laughs> Bad joke. Um, I have a potty mouth, but here it is. It's called the Straight Wall, and it's actually uh, Rupus Recta translate into uh, Straight Cliff. And I was thinking about this. This thing's 68 miles long. So this is like me driving out to Ryan Observatory plus eight miles. So that's pretty, pretty big. Uh, it's in the Sea of Clouds, which is on the lower part of the moon. I have a lunar map here that we can see on the side. Let's make that a little bigger. So it's down at the towards the bottom or the southern part here of the moon, right next to a crater called uh, Biff. No, was it Biff? Bart. Bert. That's what it is. Excuse me, Bert, but it's B-I-R-T. I knew it was one of those weird names. Uh, so in there, that's this cliff. So the 18th is the best time to photograph this. So once again, you photographers out there, I know I put out the call for the Lunar X and I got a couple of nibbles. Uh, some of you took some great shots. So maybe some of you will take a nice uh, picture of the rift. Now, one last thing, it's not really, it looks like it's a jagged cliff, but it's really not. It's more of a slope. Whoops. That's my, um, let's have one more picture here. Let's see. This one was taken by the Apollo astronauts. And you can see it's, it's more, and remember, this is really big. It's a thousand feet high. So it's huge. Um, and it's actually almost two miles wide. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually more of a slope than it is like a just drop off cliff. Um, but wow, could you imagine, uh, driving a buggy around there. I think that would be just so much fun. Uh, so we, everybody knows I love the moon. So I thought I would bring that up. Some nice little photographic challenge uh, for you guys out there who like to take your pictures. And then last but not least, we have the solstice coming up the first day of summer, the longest day of the year. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait until we hit that point because then the days get shorter and our nights will start getting longer. And I don't know about you, but I like when it's dark at five o'clock in the afternoon. I hate it when it's still light at nine o'clock at night. So that's a little bit of what we have to look forward to for the rest of the month. Uh, we have the planets uh, for, for, you know, August and, and July and, uh, you know, lots of other stuff. And I'm sure we'll post stuff on our Facebook pages and uh, we'll be doing stuff at Muddy Run. So we'll still have some planet reports for you guys. And uh, thank you for letting me present and go get those materials and do that light pollution for everybody you know, so that they all see the difference and what a big difference it sure made. Thank you. Hey, Denise, would you be willing to do that live on a Muddy Run live stream? Sure. And was it okay at this computer? Yeah. I would be at this computer. Everybody yeah. was able to see. Oh, it was perfect. Okay. Yeah, it oh, looked great, out, Denise. Yeah. You'll okay, have to look cool. at the playback. It looks really good. Nice. All right. Because well, I was so impressed when I saw it. I was like, wow. That's it's great. funny because some of the simplest things that you wouldn't think of can have the most dynamic effect. They yeah. Really can. Oh, yeah, because everybody yeah, thinks, yeah, oh, definitely. we need so much light. We need all, it's got to be so bright. But no, right. it just has to be focused the right way. And then it, right. you can, it could be as bright as you want, but it's focused down. You can see, we couldn't see the bear at all. Like I said, he could be murdered down there and <laughs> you wouldn't have known it. <laughs> we need the right amount in the right place. That's right. That's right. So well, thanks, Denise. We're going to keep the YouTube stream rolling because uh, Lou Catapiano had said, okay, we can do it live. So Lou, if you're out there, come on in. And uh, Lou wanted to, Lou's been working with us. He's very integral in our new website rollout. So, and you'll be seeing the result of his work probably this fall. Um, it's interesting that Paul Halpern's here because he's actually helping us. It, we'll have a nice thing to launch into the fall to bring people back. So uh, Lou's working with us in the background, been helping out a lot. We really appreciate it. And uh, he has a personal thing he'd like to share on day of action. Lou? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, so I, let me switch this so I know what I'm doing here. Great. Um, so yeah, I have I've been working on the website in the background, as Ted said, um, that should come out in a shortly. It's not going to be too long before that comes out. Um, but what I wanted to share tonight was something that I did in March. Um, let me share my screen, uh, share screen and here. Okay. 
So I believe you're seeing uh, the Planetary Society, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, in March, so I should also back up and say that right around the time that I joined Rittenhouse, I also kind of amped up my involvement with the Planetary Society. Um, I love both organizations. They do different things, but the one thing that we share is love for astronomy. Um, for several years, I've known about this event that they do um, called the Day of Action. And the idea is that the chief advocate for the Planetary Society allows members to join him in Washington, D.C. to meet with congressional offices. Now, because of COVID, obviously I had to be online, but it was the first year in several that I actually had the opportunity to take part in this. So the idea of the Day of Action is to get as many members of the Planetary Society as possible together, um, meet with their state representatives and state senators, and advocate for space, whether it's about funding, whether it's about research, whether it's about just involvement and if they know basically what's going on with NASA and with space research. So I have a brief little presentation. I'm not gonna talk for very, very long, but as you can see, um, you know, I was on a Zoom call with Casey Dreyer, who is the chief advocate for the Planetary Society and 155 members from all across the country. Here is one group shot of the beginning of the Zoom, the training day that we had. Uh, before we were meeting with the offices. Um, another group shot of many, many people. Uh, I also had the opportunity to be on a call with Bill Nye. He, I didn't talk to him directly, but he was part of this because he is the president and CEO of the Planetary Society. Um, the next slide I wanted to show you was the Pennsylvania group. So there was one other person that isn't in this photo, um, but Pennsylvania groups represented, um, I think, a total of four districts from around the state, uh, furthest west being out near, uh, kind of near Pittsburgh area, and then several on the east and southern east part of the state. Um, and the idea is that we met with, you know, um, here, I'll, I'll just show you the schedule real quick. Um, this is who I met with. Now, I didn't meet with the actual senators. I did not meet with the actual representatives, but we met, met with their offices and had anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes with with their representatives. And, you know, we basically just pitched why it's important for their offices, why we as constituents feel like it was important to, for them to support NASA and to support space, space science. I can't speak, I apologize. Um, of these, uh, of these people on this list, um, oh, I don't have that other, it's fine. Um, Representative Cartwright, who represents uh, the Scranton district uh, was one of the most important. He is the chair, um, of uh, the subcommittee that directly funds NASA. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It's on a separate slide, but, um, oh, here he is. The sub subcommittee of commerce, justice, science and related agencies. So he is a very big deal for NASA because he basically puts the stamp on, this is what we think NASA should get every year uh, in terms of the house of representatives. And the person that we met with him, they were all super excited. They had just left a meeting with Bill Nye and it was just a lot of fun to talk to them and to be like, hey, we think this is important we think you should fund this. Um, I don't think I have to speak to anyone else on this call about how important it is to fund space research and science and all that stuff. I think everyone here agrees. But I think the, the, one, the point I wanted to distill is that it is important for members or citizens of this country to speak to your representatives about the things that you believe in. Um, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of politics of who believes what and all that, it's fine. Like, but the important thing is that you participate in this and that you can call your offices in, in different times, visit them and say, hey, this is important to me. You need to, you know, as a member of your district or your member of your state, I want you to fund this. And I just, on a personal level, advocate for any kind of political involvement in any, any way, uh, read the budgets of your cities and districts and towns. And, um, and yeah, contact your representatives and your senators and tell them what you believe in. Um, that's that. This was a really cool day. I plan to do it next year. Hopefully at that time, um, we could do it in person. I could go to DC and meet with the offices directly. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has it, but it was cool and I wanted to share that. So thank you for, for that. Thank you though. Would you be interested in any of the members going with you? I would think it'd be great. And be, they would to do, all they had to do is they'd have to join the Planetary Society um, and sign up to participate. I think they, I think they rolled out registration in January and the event was the end of March. And uh, what is, what's their membership a year? 25, 45, 50, 50, 50. You can pay basically, I think whatever you want. I pay $10 a month. 
Okay. I just got the, the thing. Well, it's like, come back. 50 bucks is there. You get a t-shirt too if you're a new member. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. I just, you know, talk to your representatives, participate in whatever you can and, and advocate. Well, Lou, in, the, in the future, can you be like a planetary society representative for us? Can you just report on some of the things they're doing? Like yeah. c- continue to give us some commercial views of, you know, here's how you get involved or here's what's happening locally at the planetary society. Yeah, absolutely. It's, is Philip Rosamundo still there involved with it in your area? I'm not sure. I went to some meetings like two years ago, but the Philly chapter has not been very active in a while. Ah. But that's, yeah. Another oh. another community for a society to uh, to wrap its arms around. Thank okay. you, Lou. Good no, course. thank you. Really, keep us politically involved. Keep us active. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to make sure, is Al out there? Al Ryan? Al, did you want to share a little bit about Big Eyes? And let me look at all the people here just to make sure I thought I saw them out there. Al, are you uh, there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay. Can you turn your camera on? Uh, I could, I suppose. You don't have to. Did you want to share some pictures about a project? E- at least give us dates or something so people know when to look. All right, um, it'll become live on October 12th, which is uh, astronomy day for the fall of this year. And also the date when we plan to have a grand opening for the public. Um, I don't have any pictures right at hand to share. I, I didn't realize I was gonna be doing that. Nope. Um, uh, I can just describe it again for those who don't know. Uh, it's two 25-inch primary mirrors. It's an f3.7 uh, focal length. Uh, it's got uh, uh, electronic adjustments for the interocular distance. It's got electronic adjustments for uh, focusing. And it's got a third electronic adjustment if needed that alters the, uh, the primary, tertiary, secondary lens uh, configuration somewhat uh, for those really extreme people who need that in order to, to get the uh, stereo effect uh, through the eyepieces. Um, we plan to do it at a viewing angle of anywhere from, you know, 15 or 20 degrees up to about 70 degrees. It gets to be a little steep and high <laughs> and for people who have uh, vertigo or issues like that it might be a little difficult beyond that mm-hmm. um, but uh the uh the people who constructed it had a, a lot of doubts about it initially uh and first they actually refused to do it but we convinced them to do it and as time went by they were concerned about it being uh easy to operate and, and whether or not it would actually work. Um, and it was completed about, oh, about two or three weeks ago. It hasn't been brought up yet, uh, but it was completed about two or three weeks ago. And uh, it ran through a bunch of tests, uh, not just from the, the person primarily constructing it, but from a number of other uh, amateur semi-professional astronomers in the area. Um, and they all gave it uh, a thumbs up, a, a couple of wows, and all that kind of stuff. They really thought it was a fantastic instrument to, to view um, many types of objects through, not everything, but various types of objects. And it turns out that uh, what we had planned on was maybe five minutes a person making for a very limited viewing experience for the public. Turns out that they think it would take less than half a minute for people to get fully adjusted. Uh, wow. and, uh, mm. Operators will be trained to help those who really can't get to it. Um, so we, we're going to be able to, to push people through a lot faster than I thought. Uh, it's only going to operate once a month at the same time as the other two uh, telescopes are operating and possibly others uh that people bring and set up around the plaza and maybe a couple of others that that the observatory staff sets up so there'll be plenty of scopes whenever it's operating and uh we're going to make arrangements for 
private viewings too, but those will be limited and probably expensive. But October 12th is when it's there. Um, if you're a member of Rittenhouse and you can commit to a certain uh, availability, uh, we'll offer you a chance to become trained uh, to be an operator so that uh, if there is something like a private night or even on a, a public open house, we can depend on you to, to actually uh, be there to, to help with operating the telescope for the public. Um, and if you're one of these people, of course, you'll have pretty much unlimited access to it. Um, and the Rittenhouse members will probably have even greater access than the public in the sense that we'll have member nights uh, for Rittenhouse members. Can I show a picture of it? Yeah, yeah. I have one. Because I have the one from your email. If you... Thanks, Denise. Al, that's all good news. Look at that thing. And hold on, I, I have another one. I'm just gonna bring that one up too, so we can see um, it on the platform. Okay, so that's it on the platform. Wow. And then, so you give it a sense of size. There's the guys in front of it. So that's pretty amazing. I'm sorry, it's I can't have both highlighted at the same time for some reason. Uh, and I don't know what I did on that one. There we go. Ugh. Looks great. I apologize. But there you go. Al, what what do you people's think? Is appetite. That, is that, that about the size of the concrete money. pad we'll need? Um, our pad is going to be currently planned to be 22 to 24 feet in diameter. Right. Um, and uh, it'll be housed with a, a sliding shed that uh, goes back and forth on rails. Wow. All good news. And Rittenhouse members, you got the inside track. Come on, it's a great facility. We need people to help us out too. So, and then and, and think of what think of what you can have out there now. We have some amazing <laughs> equipment out there between the three observatories now. Very, very valuable. Very cool, Al. I'm excited. That looks amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Al. I want to make sure that um, I'm going to put Dave up next because he usually does a little bit with us with rocket science. I just want to make sure we had a write in for this one. Is there a Jessica out there today? I'm just scanning through all the squares here. Jessica, are you out there? Yeah, she said she was going to try and come in, but I don't see her name. So maybe okay. just check once more after Dave. And then if not, she probably just couldn't make it. Okay, no problem. Hi, Renee. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good, to, good to know the safety nets working there in the background. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's switch over to Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, our meeting Everyone. notice finally made it out. And uh, Dave, Dave's our person who takes care of that. And Dave's going to do a little bit of rocket science with us tonight. You want to take over, Dave? Yep, more than glad to. And actually, I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, yes, very excited about the two new Venus missions. Da Vinci Plus and Veritas, and I'll give you an overview, and then in the fall, I'll give you a more in-depth nice. look. But the biggie is big meeting to decide the next 20, 10 years of NASA JPL funding and which missions they're going to fund and go forward to, with. And Venus was the choice, skipping Triton and uh, Io probes out in Neptune and U Jupiter. So... What are they? Uh, da Vinci Plus is going to be the first United States purpose-built Venus lander. Now that's a very specific term. Uh, the Soviets back in the 70s and 80s put several landers, more successful than others, spoken on them in the past, really neat missions. We sent some aero probes back in the 70s and one of them actually did make it to the surface, technically making it a lander. But Da Vinci Plus is the first one actually designed to touch down on the surface and send back readings for, they're hoping an hour to two hours, depending on conditions. Because, you know, Venus is just the vacation spot. If you love molten lead and sulfuric acid and crushing pressures, you know, get on your bikini and go breathe in some smog. Uh, Veritas is a follow-up to the Magellan probe of the 80s, and it's going to use very high resolution radar to do even more mapping than those really spectacular Magellan maps that we use in every planetarium program about Venus. So that is also very exciting. So there's a lot more to come up. 
But since this was members present night, and traditionally often we'll have members share some of their favorite artifacts, space toys, book collections, uh, I have a lot of hobbies, as Ted knows, and sometimes they intersect, and that's when it gets really interesting. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, take us in just a different direction really quick. Come on. There we go. Good screen. Oops, stop. That's the end of the show, not the beginning. <laughs> so for Members Present Night, this is Ad Astra Per Stylus, which means to the stars through pens. And what do we think about when we think of space pens? Right, writing upside down. Yeah, that first gravity Yeah, this thing, pen. the famous Fisher space pen, pressurized ball ballpoint pen. Um, yep, got that. Uh, was not designed by NASA. Fisher was already developing this when NASA stumbled upon it. And no, the Soviets did not do it more cheaply by just using a pencil. Pencils had the problem of having semiconductive graphite that can clog electronics floating around in zero G. And in fact, the Soviet space program eventually bought a bunch of these pens too. You can buy them, all sorts of configurations now. This is the Fisher bullet with the nifty little space shuttle on it. Um, but wait, there's more. I have always been a big fan of fountain pens. I use them in my everyday life and have some interesting pens and inks in my collection. And I recently just, and there's a lot of things to collect in astronomy. You've got your coins. And I picked this emu from the uh, presentation a couple of years ago on Australian sky mythology. We've got our signed portraits or photographs of astronauts. That's actually the nephew of a friend of mine from the Welsh Society. So we have a triple intersection of hobbies. Uh, signed books. This is Buzz Aldrin's A Magnificent Desolation from a couple of years ago. And if you've got the really big bank, you can get some of those official Alan Bean paintings that include bits of uh, moon cloth and moon dust in them. But there are also other ways to go. I like pens. So I was perusing around my local pen uh, manufacturer, and I discovered a few things, especially around the Apollo 11 anniversary. A Korean company a couple of years ago called Colorverse, they're available through several retailers in the United States. They do what they call seasons or themes of ink, and many of them are science-related. And uh, in the upper left, you can see Abel and Miss Baker, which were two of the uh, monkeys we sent in, in the pre-human space flight. And they have recently released one for this year, which is a whole eyes on the universe, mostly focused on Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see in the upper right, Extreme Deep Field and NCG, NGC 1850 Inc. And one that I didn't get all of before they sold out was their Red Planet series, which includes Map of Mars, Mars Attacks, and all sorts of Mars-adjacent things. In fact, today, my first Eyes on the Universe set came in, and that was SM-1 and CoStar, which was, if you remember, the correction lens that Story Musgrave put in Hubble Space Telescope. And if you're not into inks and arts, uh, Barb Ryan may actually know some about this. Fountain pen inks have some interesting characteristics. It's a whole new world out there. Uh, if you look carefully at the SM1 sample, it, shade, it uh, fades from a sort of a reddish to a dark teal or greenish. That's called a shimmering ink, depending on how much ink is put on the paper. And the CoStars, this beautiful gray ink, is what they call a shading ink, which varies in intensity depending on how it's put down. So that's that. But my favorite in the collection Besides the red planet, here's my little Mars attacks with map of Mars, a red and a green ink appropriately. I want to point out the boxes. They're very precious. You can see like all the little details. If you look inside, the bottles are in those little wells. They've got the Milky Way. They've got the constellations. And I just love that little space taxi there over on the left-hand flap. I, I, I think that was just cute. I mean, every corner of these boxes has something. If you're not even into ink, uh, a box set is usually between $30 and $40. You know, it's just something neat to have as a conversation starter up on your space collection shelf. But my favorite here is the Apollo 11 50th an anniversary edition, which comes in a complete set with Apollo 11, Tranquility Bays, Columbia Eagle, One Small Step, and below you see the samples and you can see that the Apollo 11 and the Columbia are, are again those sheening inks with blue to gold and red to gold 
appropriately. They came in this really nifty box with all sorts of infographics and inserts and stickers and just, wow, it's even if you don't use the ink, it's worth it just to take this box apart to read all those, all the graphics and bits they put in. I took it apart. I really want to point out their attention to detail. If you look over on the left, that gray insert is the one that holds the Tranquility Base ink. And you can see they actually have the astronauts' footprints around the Tranquility Base. I mean, that's just neat. I just, I just love that little touch. But now let's come to my Apollo 11 anniversary piece de resistance. Oh, there's another close up where they've got all the details and nice little gold pen rest for your favorite pen. And that's what we're coming to is my favorite, I will probably never use it, Apollo anniversary pen. Made by an American company called Monteverde. It's got a picture of the moon landing on it. And it comes with this really neat moon landing box with a bottle of moon landing gray ink. And the thing about this pen is it's done in a process called Nabu, a Japanese process using a very fine curved brush. And they actually paint the pen from the inside. The barrel is clear plastic and all of that detail is painted almost like an old fashioned style store window sign from front to back. So very detailed, very, very, very exquisite work. And no tour like each one of this 888 made are going to be slightly different just because the artist's hand is going to be a little different each time. My model is number 337. So this is definitely beautiful. It's up on my shelf. I love looking at it. I am afraid to use it. It is such a beautiful pen, but it's just a neat thing to have. And I wanted to point out is the transparency of the pen. If you look carefully right above that little bit of the American flag, you can actually see the pen filler on the inside showing you how translucent it is. Held up to the light, just absolutely beautiful. So yeah, not rocket science, but if you like beautiful things, and little collectibles and trinkets. Uh, this is just sort of a neat thing to have. I'm going to. I never knew something like that existed. That's amazing. Well, mm. that's why I, that's why I brought it up. And if you are into fountain you know. pens, you are in very good I love company. Pens. I never. I never even thought of that. Guess who else is a great big pen fiend? Who? Ah, that's right, Neil. I'm going to put a link to this. Uh, one of the pen reviewers I follow, a guy named Dave who does fig boot on pens, actually went to New York and did an, a half an hour, 40 minute interview with Neil. And it is just the most charming, wonderful, amazing interview you could see. But he goes on about his pens. He started using one in, I think, high school or undergraduate school, a brand called Osma, very common pen, calligraphy pen. Neil is a fan of the left-handed oblique nib, mm -hmm. even though he's right-handed. But, you know, it's Neil. Neil can do what he wants. So if he likes it, that's just fine with me. Wait, uh, are you in addition, send this to the pen museum? <laughs> which pen museum? There's a pen museum in the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Which one are we talking here? Ah. Well, there should only be one pen museum if you're talking to do a presentation like this. Well, that's true. Yeah, it's true. So he's got his classroom. By the way, there's a line out called uh, Classic or Retro 51. They actually did like a Mercury Redstone uh, pen, but they only came in rollerball. So I wasn't interested in that. I'm a fountain pen guy. But if rollerballs are your thing, go for it. As far as fountain pens go, I think George Orwell had it right in the beginning of 1984, where the protagonist mentions that he gets a real pen and ink instead of having to use one of those awful ink crayons which he went meant by ballpoint pen. I'm going to close this out on just one more thing and look in the chat afterwards. I'll paste the links. Uh, another chap I follow, neat sort of science and society indicator, CPG Gray, you may have heard of him. He did this great factor of 10 piece recently based on the A4 metric sheet of paper. And I just, his presentation style is fast, interesting and just really thought provoking. So take a few minutes and watch this. And that is all I have for now. I'm hoping everybody has just a terrific summer and I will catch you later. And there's definitely more rocketry in the works when I get back to my usual rotation. So I'm gonna close out my presentation. 
paste my bits in the link and get my mouse over here to stop the share. This happens every time. There we go. Thank you so much, Dave. Yeah, what, a way to, what a way to, hey, if that's the end of our meeting, what a way to close the meeting out. That would be cool. I want to make sure there's nobody else out there who, who wanted to present. So everybody who's out there, was there anybody else who did want to put anything forward? Yes, no? Okay, so you're not yeah. I want to know below. I just want to know if everybody's going to watch the, anybody's going to try Like, Joe, are you going to try the Eclipse? Well, wait a second. Oh, Let's... Yeah, yeah, I was going to try. My Eastern sight lines are terrible, but I'm going to make a chance. Hold on, Denise. I'd like you to continue that topic, but I want to stop the YouTube feed. I want to close out our international okay. audience. So those of you who have tuned in from around the world, around the globe, uh, all I can say is look back at the beginning of this live stream and think about what I said. Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. We truly are a society because if you look at the topics that we just covered tonight and you look at the different things that came together, we're not just bonded by our interest. Uh, we have a varied interest and we have a very, very group of people that contribute. Again, tonight makes me very proud to be part of this whole operation. So signing off of YouTube, don't go signing off our members.